we were kind of getting into planning around this series, we realized that when we're approaching a topic like today's topic of infertility, we know that in a 40, 45 minute episode, there's only so much that we can cover because there's so much to be covered in this and we can't do it all. But where do we want to start? And where are the the women that we're listening to right now who are walking through infertility? What are they struggling with and what do they need to know? And I think it would be really helpful to know, Rachel, first, let's talk to you. Mm-hmm. We know infertility is common among women. I know that I was a woman who struggled with infertility for about two years years, but how common is it actually? It's pretty common. And in fact, I was reviewing the numbers and it was just surprising that it's 20% of couples. Wow. And so when you're sitting in a baby dedication at church and you look around, you know that 20% of couples, at least even some of them on the stage, but at some point have experienced infertility. And so we know that this is not uncommon by any means. I mean, it's it's far more common than getting a speeding ticket um, mm-hmm. if we look at it with those numbers. So mm-hmm. it's very common. And so we know it's something that's really important to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wow. I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't realize it was 20%. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. a lot, y'all. And just to think about how rarely I feel like, at least in the circles uh-huh. I am, it's really not talked about much because mm-hmm. it feels kind of uh, maybe a little embarrassing for uh-huh. some folks, mm-hmm. you know, and like, yeah. why can't, why can't this work for me, you mm-hmm. know? And so I'm so glad we're talking about it today. I know, you know, this isn't a new struggle. Um, uh-huh. It's been happening for centuries since humans, you know, have been around. What's really interesting to me is when we look at scripture I am vaguely remembering, I'm not a biblical scholar, but um, there's quite a few stories of infertility in scripture. So Wendy, from to share a little bit about what we see in scripture and how often we see this in scripture. Yeah, well, you're right. And I don't think about it very much because it's sort of scattered throughout. But yeah, it's not a new thing. It's called a different word. It's called barrenness or being barren in the Bible, but it's the same thing, that inability to have a baby. And it's honestly been around since Genesis, you know, the very beginning. So what's interesting about it is though, back in those days, that was a woman's primary role. Like that's what she was valued for, her ability to have children Mm -hmm. and most especially to have a male child, to carry on the legacy of the family, to work in the farms and the fields. So when in that time, in biblical times, if they couldn't conceive it brought great shame on the woman as well as her family. And the Old Testament has at least six stories that are kind of common names that you, you, you know when people talk about scripture. And they either went to, they took desperate measures to manipulate their circumstances so they could have a child, even when God had promised them a child, that would be Abraham and Sarah, the best example. Um, to where they let their husband sleep with another woman so that they could have a child. Um, But they also cry out to God. And that's another, we're going to just talk about two examples today. So, but they, they do things, they get desperate. They do things because a lot of times in that day, the society attributed their infertility to um, a flaw, a sin Mm -hmm. or a wrong. And so Mm -hmm. that shame that was brought on them and they were even mocked. Um, we're gonna talk about Hannah who was mocked for, for not being able to have a baby. So first in the story of Sarah and Abraham, Sarah, I alluded to the fact, God had made a promise that they could were going to have a child and Sarah just couldn't wait anymore. So she arranged for her husband, Abram, Abraham, to sleep with her maidservant and Her name was Hagar. And she did that because she didn't trust God that the baby would come. So she wanted to manipulate circumstances and make it happen. So it's a very sad story because when Hagar became pregnant, all of a sudden, Sarah began to resent her and was cruel to her. And the reason I'm going a little more into that story is because it's a picture I want us to remember. Hagar ran away pregnant into the wilderness And she was devastated and afraid and alone, but God came to her 
-hmm. It says in scripture, he found her, he called her by name, he ministered to her, he gave her promises, and he sent her back to be with Abraham and Sarah. And the beauty in this story is at the end of the story, Hagar gave God a name. The very first woman, she gave God a name called El Roy, the God who sees me. And that is what I want us to cling to as we move on. Um, But I want to also tell you about Hannah because Hannah was a little different story about she also could not conceive a baby and she wanted one so desperately. She prayed, she prayed, she cried out to God. And finally, she went to the temple and she just threw herself down and she prayed desperately. And God came to her, met her there through a priest named Eli. So both of these stories are so beautiful because these women, it's the word scripture used for Hannah is she was crushed in spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so beautiful to just know that's how broken she was. Um, but this, they provide this hope that God showed up in different ways in these stories because he saw them. And so mm-hmm. as we begin the conversation for the next three episodes, I want us to remember these stories that God mm-hmm. sees us and he hears us and he knows us by name and he's with us. Mm-hmm. Winnie, that's so good. I think uh, the biggest struggle that I know I experienced when I walked through infertility was the whole waiting game and not knowing like, you know, is this month going to be the month and uh, how long is this going to take? And what you said a minute ago about uh, these stories of women in the Old Testament often maybe going into manipulating their circumstances out of desperation. I don't think that uh, that was what I would have called what I was doing, you know, in my own flesh and sinful nature, trying to manipulate my circumstances to get the outcome that I wanted. But I think for anybody who's walking through this struggle right now, waiting is really, really hard because you never know when that is actually going to happen. And Rachel, I would love for you to be able to speak to maybe this time trap that we find ourselves in as we're in this cycle of infertility when our our mind and our, our flesh wants to go and try to manipulate or control, what are the things that we can do to wait well mentally and not go there whenever we're in this season of waiting? Oh, what a question, Kaylee. But um what a an important thing for us to be talking about. Um, you know, I once heard someone say that infertility was the most painful and most expensive roller coaster ride she ever got on. Mm-hmm. And she was like, I don't like roller coasters, Rachel. <laughs> and I remember thinking, it just, I think I'll never forget that moment as long as I live because it was such a powerful tearful representation of what she was experiencing. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to wait and be on this ride, um, but she felt very called to be a mom. And so I just want to really quick honor that, that waiting stinks, guys. It's not Mm -hmm. fun. We don't enjoy it in our flesh. We don't enjoy it. Even I think when we're super close to the Lord, we don't like waiting and waiting on something that we feel is our biological and spiritual calling just stinks. And I guess I just would want anyone that's going through infertility or has experienced infertility or loving on somebody with infertility, I would just want them to hear that first, that I, I hear that, I see that, we see that, and and I'm just, I'm sorry if you're going through that or have gone through that. Um, I know for myself, when I went through some short infertility for a couple of years, I remember I went to 13 baby showers in one year. And every time somebody else got pregnant, it was, it was hard because it really was the ultimate thief of joy for me because of the fact I felt like I couldn't be happy for all of my dear friends and family members that were getting pregnant, getting pregnant, getting pregnant. And here, I didn't know if that ever was going to happen for me. Um, And so just to encourage everyone that's listening, that if you feel that way, 
most every woman I've ever talked to has said those things and has felt that way. Um, so I just would want to encourage that. But it is a good question. How do we wait well? And it's a hard pill to swallow. But I usually eventually talk to women about how do we make some goals while still trying to get pregnant? How do we make some non-baby related goals? And I don't ever want women to hear kind of that cliche of, well, it'll happen when you stop trying. You know, the moment you file the adoption papers, that's when you're going to get pregnant. You know, women that are infertile really don't like hearing that. They get really frustrated typically. And it's not, you know, if we've said those things, it's understandable. We're trying to help, but typically that's not the most helpful comment to make. So just to encourage that it does help to make some goals outside of the ovulation kits that are piling up in the bathroom trash can. It is good to make some goals outside of that during this time, because I firmly believe, girls, I firmly believe that we are all called to mother in some capacity. It's just what capacity we end up being a mother. We're all called to love on the girl down the street that's 10 years younger than us that needs a mother figure. We're all called to be aunts and uncles and ministry leaders. None of us get out of this scot-free. None of us get out of this without being leaders and being a foster mom and being an adoptive mom. I really believe we're all called to mother. It's just what capacity we end up being a mother. That might be biologically, that might be uh, being really involved in ministry. We just, we don't know exactly what that looks like, but I don't think that even while we're trying to get pregnant, I don't think we get to stop ministering. And I know that for me was very hard, but I use that time to say, okay, God, who else can I pour into right now? And that for me was very healing. And for just my personal story, took a lot of the pressure off every baby shower I went to, to not feel that that tremendous a thief of joy in my heart. I still was full of joy because I had these other things that God was doing in my life during that time. That's good. Rachel, let's dig into that. I do have a question though. Like I love the big overarching goal of being able to love someone else. But if someone were really kind of stuck in that cycle, is there anything that you would have them do on a daily or weekly basis to kind of refocus that that life that they need to live elsewhere outside of where they feel so stuck right now? Like you said, ministry doesn't stop, but how do they keep track and make sure that they're focusing where they need to focus instead of only yeah. thinking about infertility? I'd love to build on that question a little bit because I yeah. think I didn't go through a long season of infertility, but with my first child, we got pregnant right away. And then with my second child, it took a whole year. It was over a year before mm-hmm. of, of trying, right? And I just remember every single month, when my period would come, it was such a trigger Mm -hmm. and I would spiral. I would just spiral down and feel so defeated. And I would become, Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, being totally transparent here, kind of obsessive (laughs) compulsive Mm -hmm. (laughs) about tracking my ovulation. What am I eating? Am I drinking enough water? Um, Am I exercising too much? Like I, it was on my mind constantly. And so Mm -hmm. apart from setting those other goals, what are some of those practical things that we can do on that daily, weekly to kind of redirect some of those, that anxious, those anxious thoughts and Mm -hmm. feelings around Mm -hmm. trying to get pregnant? That's great, Mm -hmm. Mary. So even though obviously I'm not diagnosing anyone that's listening necessarily with OCD, it does become... Meredith, an OCD type of a cycle. And it becomes, we have, and I actually posted a graphic on my Instagram about it, where with OCD or an OCD related thought, so again, I'm not telling everyone you have OCD out there if you've gone through this, is we have the obsession. And so here the obsession is, I've got to get pregnant, or I've got to be a mom, or I hope I get pregnant. And so you would have to fill in the blank for whatever your obsession is. And then that leads to fear and anxiety. Then that leads to the compulsion and the compulsion is a set of behaviors. So maybe going through and writing down and looking through your journal and seeing maybe what have I been eating? What have I been drinking? Maybe I need to take another ovulation test. Maybe I need to take another pregnancy test. Maybe I need to call these friends or Google it for the rest of the day. Um, So a lot of times, and even just the Googling can be Mm. a part of the compulsion. And then that leads for the anxiety, it leads to some temporary relief. But 
girls, that temporary relief is very fleeting because mm-hmm. that temporary relief lies to us and says that it's fixing the obsession. It is not fixing the obsession. It is giving us some temporary relief, which then leads us back around on that circle, straight back to the top, and we start obsessing all over again. So the way, so we're looking at that little four-part cycle, and the way that we deal with that is we delay our obsessions, or we schedule our obsessions. And yes, Mm -hmm. ladies, in a perfect world, we wouldn't obsess. Absolutely. We should not make this an idol. I am aware that is completely biblically solid. We do not make this an idol. But if we struggle, what would it be like to schedule an hour a day where you pray, think, journal about your infertility? Mm -hmm. And the rest of the day, you say, I'm going to think about that from 8 to 9 p.m. tonight. Or I'm going to think about that from 12 to 1. And the rest of the day, I'm not going to obsess. I'm not going to fuel that obsession with the behaviors that then lead to the temporary relief, which lie to us. Mm-hmm. And it does create, it just, for me, it was all it was all I could think about for a year of my mm-hmm. life. It was horrible. Yeah. It, was, it was a prison that I never want to be in again. And so with that, I, I actually didn't know at the time that I wish I would have scheduled time And it seems weird to schedule your time to obsess, but it's really Mm -hmm. healthy to schedule your time. And girls, pray. Mm -hmm. Go go to the feet of Jesus. He cares. He cares. Mm -hmm. Hannah was bitter and she still prayed. And that's my favorite thing about Hannah. She was bitter. Scripture says she was bitter and she still went to the feet of our God. And so use that time, schedule it and delay your compulsions. And so when you feel the need to take a pregnancy test twice a day, I've, I'm raising my hand, full transparency. I've done it. I had to learn to say, I'm going to wait two days Mm -hmm. and I'm going to wait and take it because delaying the compulsion helps not feed the obsession. Yeah. You know, oh, is it, I, what what I wanted to share was, um, one of the things that you talked about trying to get your mind off of it. And I, one of my dearest friends, she's actually our pastor's wife went through years of infertility. And um, what she did was she prayed and felt very called to serve at a crisis pregnancy center. Mm -hmm. And it was the very last place she would have wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And, um, but she did it out of obedience and she served there every single week in some bitterness in the beginning. But the longer she served, the easier it became. And the stories of the women that she worked with and the stories of the children that came, she has some amazing stories that, but for her serving there, who knows what would have happened. And she's the one who taught me this scripture from Isaiah 58. And it says, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. And, it, and wow. when we serve, when we take our eyes off ourselves, and we sow into a need that we so desperately want, that brings light, not in only into whom we're serving, but it really brings light and hope into us. Mm. I love that, Wendy. I think what that does is I think oftentimes we make, or at least I was, when I went through that year of trying to get pregnant, and y'all, I'm just going to be totally transparent. It was the worst year of my marriage. Like mm-hmm. we, it was the most tense we had ever been. It was, we fought more than we had ever fought. I, because I was having all these obsessive, and it was totally obsessive thoughts. I could never stop thinking about it. Now, Rachel, you telling me I should have scheduled. Honestly, I'm like, whoa, that would have really helped. Yeah. Because instead I just peppered my husband with text messages all the time, y'all. Mm-hmm. It was just because I was feeling anxious. I wanted to tell him about my anxiety. Mm-hmm. And then he felt like, I can't fix this. I can't fix this. And Wendy, when you read that scripture, I realized, I think in that season, I was making motherhood a destiny, my destination. I was trying, Mm -hmm. if I can just become a mom again, Mm -hmm. I need to have two. My son can't have, I don't want my son to be an only child. Like I, it was this destination I was trying to get to when our destination is sanctification. You guys, Mm -hmm. (laughs) our destination Mm -hmm. is not necessarily becoming a mom, but allowing 
making ourselves more like Christ in the process of whatever he's walking us through. And I think I had just gotten my focus so fixated on if I can just have another child, Mm -hmm. I will have, I will get to where God wants me to go. And Mm -hmm. boy, did he use that year (laughs) to really sift some things out of my heart. Um, I want to talk a little bit, you know, I think we've talked a lot about the mental waiting game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, we've got to take control of those thoughts, scheduling our time to obsess, Mm -hmm. you know, refocusing our actual physical energy onto someone else and setting some goals. But there's a whole spiritual side of this, y'all, that that runs deep. We've alluded a lot to praying, and I think that that's really important. Mm -hmm. But Wendy, what do you see in scripture about this waiting game in scripture? (laughs) It's just not stuff you want to hear when you're in infertility, right? When you're I in the way. It's hard. Yeah. It hurts. And that's, <laughs> I, I want to preface, like, I feel like I'm bringing in the biblical part. And every time I bring in the biblical part, it feels like it's bad news. But it, by the time we finish it, it's really good news. But, um, but the Bible is the same way. There are weight stories all the way back to Genesis. It is part of this. And this is really going to be, we'll introduce it today and talk a lot more about waiting and what we get out of waiting next next um, episode. But, but the Bible's full of stories. And so I'm going to start with a story um, that has nothing to do with motherhood or infertility. But to me, when I've been in really hard weights in my life. This is the story, the very first story God took me to. And it's from the book of Daniel that I don't spend a lot of time in. But when it feels like God isn't listening or acting on my behalf, this story from Daniel chapter 10 is the story of where Daniel is fasting and praying on his knees for weeks on behalf of the Israelites. And as he's doing that, he hears literally nothing. Every day, imagine you get to that 21st day fasting and praying. And then it says, beginning in verse 12, relax, Daniel. This is the, an, an angel came and it's believed it's the angel Gabriel. So it's one of the top angels came to Daniel and said, relax, Daniel, don't be afraid. From the moment you decided to humble yourself, to receive understanding, your prayer was heard and I set out to come to you, okay? Stop there and just hear what that's saying is, you've been doing this for three weeks, but I'm telling you from the moment you started, God heard you, but here's the explanation. But I was waylaid by the angel prince of the kingdom of Persia and delayed for a good three weeks. But then Michael, one of the chief angel princes, intervened to help me, And I left him there with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And now I'm here to help you understand what will eventually happen to your people. Daniel 10, 12 through 14. So God heard Daniel's prayer. God valued Daniel's prayer. But this wait was necessary in this situation. And Daniel was left waiting with no answer because God was other kingdom work. Other things were going on that had to be attended to. Does that make Daniel less important? No, but Daniel learned something through this. And so here's, it's hard, but I want you to know, I haven't dealt with infertility, but I've dealt with very difficult waiting. And so when it seems God isn't active and he's not active in the area of life that you necessarily want him to be and think he should be, and I got those words from Kaylee because she's been there, doesn't mean he's not acting. It doesn't mean he's not working. And we're going to see more and more as we go on. So this isn't a trite response. This is we are building in scripture why we have to wait sometimes and what we gain and what God is doing in the wait. But I also want to tell you that there's another verse that brings me a lot of comfort from Psalm 58. And it's David. And Psalm 56, 8 says, to God, he's praying, you've kept track of my every toss and turn through the sleepless nights. Each tear has been entered in your ledger and each ache written in your book. If you can think of that, when you're crying in the middle of the night, 
when you don't understand where God is. I go to that and I'm reminded. He, I may not hear from him right now, but he's telling me he knows when I'm lying awake. He's there with me. He knows the number of tears I cry. Each one is written in his book. So those are things we can hold on to. And if you're ready, we can talk about where we find hope. Do you want to go there? Let's do it, Wendy. Okay. I, well, I want before you move on, I want you to say that scripture reference again in Psalm because I feel like right now there's there's a listener who's going through this and it just she feels really lonely and she feels like nobody sees or understands her tears. And I just I want you to say that scripture again. Okay. So that maybe she's driving and she now she has a chance to jot it down because I just think it's so powerful. So what was that Psalm? Okay, it's Psalm 56, 8, and it says, you've kept track of my every toss and turn through the sleepless nights. Each tear entered in your ledger, each ache written in your book. And that's from the message, which is um, just a unique translation of the Bible. If you want it in the NIV, then I can also tell it to you. It says, Record my lament, list my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Mm. So, um, so good, Wendy. And I, I love that there's this moment of saying you're not alone, mm -hmm. you know, in this, in this yeah. battle with infertility, you are not alone. It's not going, you, you talked about Hagar earlier. It's not going unseen. Right. He's the God who sees. So let's talk about hope. Okay. How do we keep going? So like how in the midst of this waiting where do we find our And home? like, you can see I'm like bursting because I want to share this because the, the rest of what we're going to talk about the next few weeks, this is your setup right here because in God's word, that's where we're going to find hope. And so every week we're directing you to scripture. We're directing it to you for truth, for comfort, um, for hope. And we're going to invite you to meditate on it, to read it, to pray it, to literally declare it over yourself. And why are we doing this? Because Romans 15, 4 says, for everything that was written in the past, and I want you to listen to the active verbs, and then we're going to go over them. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in scripture and the encouragement it provides, we might have hope. Okay. Those are powerful words. God says, I sent this word to teach you, to encourage you, to equip you to endure so that you can have hope in the wait. And then another place in Romans chapter five, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. And okay, we're going to talk a lot more next week about this. I'm not going to be able to dive in. So hold on. What we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And that word rejoice isn't like woohoo, we're having a party, joyful rejoicing. It in, in the Greek, it means to boast, boast or hold your head up high. And so what it's telling us is that in that suffering, when we know the word, which we're going to be learning, we can know that suffering has purpose. Our weight, our, our grief, our loss has purpose and it's productive and God will use it for our good and his glory. And, and that sounds trite, but we're going to break that down later on. But what I want us to remember is we cannot, we cannot learn endurance by a daily devotional once a week or going to church a few times a month or reading our Bible every now and then. Endurance, a lot of times, the only way we can learn it is walking through a trial and um, trusting and obeying God. In one of the Bible studies I taught, a woman said this, and I wrote it down, and I've never forgotten it. God's faithfulness is most effectively learned when experienced. Sometimes the only way we can trust and know the faithfulness of God is walking through things where we just show up every day, even when we don't want to. And he ends up showing us 
whatever it is he has to teach us. And then Isaiah 41 10 is something I clung to during a really hard time in my life. I was um, raped by a, a masked man hiding in my apartment when I was 21 years old, right a few days after my college graduation. And I lived in fear for a long, long time. And this verse Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. And listen to what he promises, aside from telling us not to fear and not to be dismayed in the place, the hard place we're in. But he says, I will strengthen you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. And those verbs, those verbs of I'm with you. And I will strengthen you and I will help you. And when you're falling down and you don't want to get out of bed and you don't want to be around people, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. It's a strong hand and he is there. And so um, if you want to wait well, I'll just end with these three um, things that are very short and maybe you can write them down. It just waiting well, biblically cry out and draw near. And I mean, tell God everything. Like if you are angry with him and you are mad at him, tell him because he already knows, right? So just tell it, write it down. I did that. And then meet him in his word because that is truth. That's where his thoughts become our thoughts. That's where his ways we begin to understand more and more so we can accept them and trust in them and believe them. And then it's a lot of what Rachel talked about. Don't dwell, keep moving. So into your need, um, make goals for yourself, do those kind of things. Um, and then if we have time, Meredith, I do have just a few things at the very end, if we want to just declare over them as we head into the next week. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and do that now, Wendy. Let's do it. And then we'll wrap up. Okay. If you're somewhere where you can close your eyes, then close your eyes. And if you're not, especially if you're driving, I just want you to let these words from scripture stand over you and then soak into you. Sweet daughter, your heavenly father has compassion on you. He will be faithful to comfort you. Let him in. Your heavenly father hears your prayers, so cry out to him. He receives your tears as liquid prayers, and those tears are precious to him. He is present with you. Wrap yourself in his sweet presence and peace. Quiet your soul. Receive his love and care. Go before him as often as you need. Be honest, be real, because he loves you and he's waiting for you. Wow, Wendy, thank you so much for just wrapping us up today with that declaration. I know at the very beginning, Meredith and I said, there's no way we can talk about everything there is emotionally uh, that women go through while experiencing miscarriage, but or while experiencing infertility. But I do just want to end with how I'm feeling right now, and that's hopeful mm-hmm because we're pointing people back to the hope that they can find in God's word, knowing that God meets them where they are. And from the first moment that they open their mouth to pray, that's what we learn in Daniel chapter 10, that God hears it, even if he doesn't answer it immediately. And mm-hmm. so I, I think what, what is resonating with me is this thought is that your hope and the weight is part of your ministry right now. And I think as believers, I wish that I could tell you how long you were going to have to wait. I wish I could tell you um, exactly when you were going to get that positive pregnancy test or just some sort of an answer. I, I wish that that was a guarantee, but it's not. And that's the hard, hard truth about waiting. And so often about what we go through, whether you're struggling with infertility right now or whether you're struggling with some other type of waiting, this is perfectly applicable to anything that you're walking through right now. But I think as believers, the hope that we have in the wait is the ministry that we can have in the moment, especially knowing there's 20% of other couples out there who are struggling too. Not all of them are believers. And if mm-hmm. I, if this purpose in 
my waiting for those two years or Meredith, however long you waited, Rachel, however long you waited, whoever you're listening, whoever is listening right now, however you're long you're waiting, if, if this purpose is to show someone else the hope that you have in Christ, then that's worth it to me. That's mm-hmm. hard. That's a hard truth, but that is worth it. And then I think Rachel would agree with me whenever I say this, but you don't have to wait perfectly either. Mm-hmm. It's okay to have a bad day. It's okay for you to feel like you uh, don't have it together or that maybe you slip in this, but slip back into some of those tendencies because I know I did it too. I'm human and we, we mess up and there is grace for that. But the hope that we have is found in God's word. And so guys, thank you so much for walking us through that today. Um, mentally and spiritually, I learned so much. And I know that the people who are listening learned a lot too. And we're going to be back here again next week because infertility really is just one side of the struggle that many women experience on the journey to motherhood. But for some, infertility eventually ends in a healthy pregnancy. And it does kind of seem to tie up in a nice, neat bow. But for others, including myself, uh, last year, I experienced a miscarriage after walking through that. And it was a devastatingly painful season, or maybe they have even lost a child that they've brought earthside. And so we're going to talk about miscarriage and infant loss next week because they are different. And we want to address those of you who are walking through that or have walked through that. And so we will be back with Rachel and Wendy to dig into that even more. Well, we've got a few resources we do want to connect you to. But first, before we do that, if you're walking through this and are trying to do it well, and mm-hmm. you're to a place where you've realized, I need help. I need yeah. help outside of my current circle of friends or the mm-hmm. people around me. Proverbs 31 Ministries really stands behind, endorses, and encourages biblical Christian counseling. And we want to recommend by starting out with the American Association of Christian Counselors, you can go to aacc.net to look up Christian counselors in your area to get started with finding somebody who might be able to help you um, go through this hard season. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And we've also pulled together a free PDF download for you that's available at proverbs31.org slash listen in the show notes for today's episode that includes scriptures and key points for what we discussed today, as well as what we'll discuss in the upcoming episodes. It'll kind of be a broad overview of everything that we're talking about over the next three weeks that you guys can download it for free and use on your own as you continue to process what you're learning. And if you're listening to this and you know a friend who needs a resource to guide her through a season of waiting, and really it could be any kind of waiting, you guys, mm-hmm. we recommend Lisa Turkhurst's book, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. You can get a copy today at p31bookstore.com. And I just want to say thank you for mm-hmm. tuning in today. Uh, I know this is a hard subject to mm-hmm. talk about, but it's so needed. And so at Proverbs 31, we really believe that when you know the truth of God's word and you live it out, you'll see that everything really does change.